Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Always glad to be here and definitely feel a part of the community. Um, even from Roseville, Citrus Heights, uh, where I live, I always feel like I'm part of the community. So thank you for keeping me um, and allowing me to, to, to still partake. Um, I'm pray and then and get going. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for uh, how it spoke then and how it's speaking now. Uh, be with us as we hear from you today and uh, give us something to carry us uh, through to the, to the next moment. In Jesus' name. So the temple was beautiful. I'll give you a quick history on the temple that he's talking about, the Great Lodge. Uh, it was built by Solomon for worship after Israel has spent years in the wilderness with only the tabernacle, right? The tabernacle is what they use to hold the glory of God. And, 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 and it was finally rebuilt. And Deborah Mumford says in the temple that Herod had employed the most talented artisans to use the best materials for the project, such as white marble that was up to 60, 67 feet long, 12 feet high, and 12 feet wide. Blue, scarlet, and purple Babylonian tapestries made of fine linen formed a veil at the entrance. And he had insist, installed gold, gold and silver-plated gates and gold-plated doors throughout. The temple meant everything to these people because the temple is what they use to hold the glory of God. And I, too, so many times have wanted to hold the glory of God. This isn't bad. There's nothing wrong with the temple. Jesus doesn't call them foolish for having a temple. He just says with sadness, it's going to fall. There's nothing wrong with holding and cherishing these God-breathed moments in our lives. Do you remember that revelation you got 10 years ago that changed your life? That, that sermon you heard five years ago that, that totally changed uh, where you were going? That moment and those relationships you had, some of those friend groups you had, how amazing it was to graduate, to learn something new, how amazing those particular people were in your life. And those were the moments we wanted to hold on to. And those were the times we wanted to build a temple and cherish it and we could celebrate it. And still, we have to hear when God says, okay, it's time for something to change. I remember the day I decided to become a Christian. I was like 15 years old, right? And uh, I, had, I had went from my home church to this church out in the suburbs of Chicago, right? I'm from the city of Chicago. And it was this big church with lights, and they had a big show, and I think they had some, some camos, and right, they had the bells and whistles. And I remember sitting there in the middle of the service, in, in the middle of the sanctuary, and just feeling like, all right, it's time. I felt something move, something, something deep, something that said, this is the moment, this is worth everything. And for me, I felt like this is what I want to commit my life to. This, this moment, this faith, this voice I hear God right now, this is what I want to give everything to. And though that moment was everything, though that moment was foundational to so much that has happened in my life, I, I have to be honest and say that, that that moment has passed. That point of faith, those messages that I carried, those messages that I held on to that took me from day to day at that age and on from there, all that has evolved into something that doesn't look like that. And that's sad, and, 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 and there's a lot to remember and a lot to mourn from there, and, and the journey that it took for get from there, to get from there. But I, I got to say, I wouldn't want to go back, and I don't think I can go back. There's a lot of times that I felt like I've experienced the glory of God. And like Peter, when he saw Jesus and Moses and Elijah, he said, let me build a tent here. We need to cherish this moment. And I get it. I want to hold all these same moments. As a, as a society, we've accomplished a lot of great things. Democracy is astonishing, right? This country. But we know, right, as we remember the native people, that those things didn't come justly. And our country was built on principles and practices that were just not right. We can say we did some great things, but also that the temple has to fall. The way it was built wasn't right. I think there's another way that this could be built that's more just. It's not a crime to want to hold on to these moments, to, to, to cherish these glorious moments. But Jesus, who knew the temple history, the Jewish people's history, he looks at it with sadness. And standing at it, he says, this temple was going to fall. So that last place 
you may have saw God, that, that last glorious experience you had, that, play, that last place we reached out to society. Unfortunately, it's going to fall. And the temple might be a moment of sadness, too. When a, when a great loss comes, it holds you. It's not necessarily something you adore, but when a great loss hits you, you don't really want to go anywhere else. I recently lost a coworker uh, a couple of weeks ago to gun violence up there in uh, Sacramento. And, 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 it, and it reminded me of so many other moments of great loss for me. I remember that day showing up to work and still thinking, how, can, how are we still doing things, right? How are things still moving? It didn't affect everybody. Everybody wasn't connected to him. But it, it, it's still me and it's still some of my coworkers to say, how can we go on? These are the temples that hold us. They catch our attention, good or bad. They're still heavy and glorious. We can't look away. Despite the investment and gloriousness which with these temples were built, Jesus, steals walk, Jesus still walks up and says, this thing that you think is the greatest thing, this thing that you think could never fail or could never move or could never change, this thing that holds the glory of a God, this too will be destroyed. And it seems so impossible. It leaves us with the same question I think the disciples had, right, when they asked. It, it, it gives us the question of, Jesus, if not this, then what? I was talking to a friend recently about transitions and evolutions of faith. And I'm grateful for those shifts in my own life. That since there's something else calling me, there's something, there's something else to go to, a greater, a greater freedom, right? A yellow light before a green light. But I also cried and mourned because this faith is is what has carried me so far. This faith is what my life is built on. This faith is what I went to school for. This faith is where all my relationships are rooted. So Jesus, if not this, then what? And again, we see it with people in good spots. We see it with people in privileged spots, in bad spots, in poverty and oppressive spots. People who feel like they've worked as part of a system that hurts others, but this is all they got. The message again is to God, if not this, then what? This is my home. I know something has to change, but what? And it's just like the Israelites in the desert crying out to Moses. They said, it would have been better if we stayed in Egypt. The out there is scary. Stepping out hurts. Why don't we just stick with what we're used to? If not this, then what? And Jesus in a body just like ours. Knowing what's at stake if the temple falls. Scripture says a look of sadness came over the face of creator sets free. Jesus knows how much the temple has meant to us. He knows that it took a lot to build. And yeah, Jesus, so this is too much, right? Um, if this is going to fall, I'm going to need a heads up. I'm going to need some tips. I'm going to need you to, you know, send me a text before it falls. Uh, so the disciples, they say, Jesus, what will be a sign? If not this, then what? And if only we could have signs and get ready and be waiting for the change with our bags packed, ready for that bus to sort of show up. And instead of saying, yes, I'll give you a sign, Jesus instead, I think, gives them some things to reduce the anxiety of the constant change of that, that future temple falling. He says, uh, he says in verse 8, make sure no one leads you down the wrong path. For many will falsely represent me and say, I am the chosen one, follow me, there is no time left. Do not follow after them. So Jesus doesn't give us a sign. He says we have to watch out for those saying there's no time left. For the one saying we have to rush, we need to do this, or we will burn. Jesus is not a fear stoker. He doesn't lead by fear. He doesn't invite his disciples into something to be afraid of or to run from. He doesn't make us anxious and, and lead us by our fears. Instead, he tells us, yes, the temple will fall. Don't follow the one who's appealing to your fears. Listen to my calm voice that appears to your soul. 
Don't run for the quick fix. Don't run after the one who says, I'm the chosen one and I can fix all your problems. Jesus doesn't tell them the exact signs. But I think he, he gives us a clear sign of who not to follow. Right now, right election season, there's a, there's a lot of political leaders telling if we don't choose them, we're going to burn, right? And I'm not saying we shouldn't follow political leaders and we shouldn't invest politically. But instead of them guiding us by telling us we need to avoid our, our greatest fear, Jesus moves us and telling us to move towards love and towards, towards that next glory. There's not one politician, there's no one set of beliefs, there's no one moment, there's no one policy that'll take us from death to life. One of my professors uh, recently described justice work as a work that constantly reevaluating the system to make it more and more just. So that one law, that one legislation, that one viewpoint, it might have helped someone then, but it could still be more just. So we shouldn't Listen just to that one voice, but listen for the voice of God and see where he's genuinely taken us. And I don't think that's a fleeing to an old temple, but to something we may have never seen before. So Jesus is not a God of fear or anxiety, a God who gives you one chance to get it right or you'll burn. He's a God of light burdens, a God of love, a God who chose rest as his grand finale. Verse 9, it says, when you hear the wars and uprisings, do not fear, for these things will come first, but the end is not yet. And so they keep saying the end is here. They want us to think the end is now, but Jesus said 2,000 years ago that the end is not yet, and the same is true now. Even though temples are falling all around us and falling in our own lives, the end is not yet. In verse 11 and 12, he says, there will be great earthquakes, food will be scarce, sickness will spread everywhere, and bad signs will appear in the sky. Before all this happens, you will be betrayed by your own people. They will hunt you down, drag you into their gathering houses, and put you in jail. They will hand you over to the government and officials of the people of iron. And I think he's describing real life things that are going to happen to the people he's speaking to. And I don't think this is meant for all of us and every person who ever follows Jesus. But I think what he is saying to us is it will be hard. Difficult things will be happening all around you and even to you, but this is not the end. And again, this isn't a a message he's using to prompt fear, but instead the opposite. He's saying it will be hard. Hard things will be around you. Hard things will happen to you, but the temple has to fall. We've lived in temples of white supremacy. We've lived in temples of devastating capitalism, of a health care that's innovative, but it's also become crippling. And so while it was once glorious, it has to fall. We have to imagine what's next. And we, and we have that opportunity, but Jesus still doesn't sugarcoat it. All these things, as it falls, it will be hard. In verse 13, he says, but remember, this will be your chance to represent me and tell them the good story. And Jesus isn't saying when these things are hard, this will be your chance to invite them to church. He's saying this will be your chance to show them how resurrection works. To show them that I told you the temple was going to fall. And I told you that this was not the end. And right in the midst of some of the hardest things in your life. That's when you show them that I implanted resurrection in you and I implanted resurrection in the universe. And I put it, and so while people are running to the one that says they're going to save you, they're going to watch you and see that this is the good story, that it's not over. They didn't just survive. They imagined and saw something come to light that none of us could have predicted. They didn't flee back to some story of the past, some temple of before, the things that used to be. These people came up with something brand new. Jesus doesn't hate when we stay in the good moments. But in this passage, he's telling us that we don't have to to think that the past past temples is the best that God can do. And so, like I say, I'm grateful for those moments. I'll stay there for as long as possible. But when that temple is destroyed, I'll be ready. I'll be sad, but I won't be worried that this is the end. I won't be afraid of the things on the outside. I even won't be afraid of the changes on the inside. 
I know that this will lead me to being able to one day tell that glorious story, that I went from one glory and for reasons I may not understand through hell and to another glory. So as we lose that attachment from temple, there's three things I think we can hold on to. The first is the Spirit of God. Jesus ascends because he won't let us become attached to the things that might drift, but instead gives us the Spirit which will never leave. In verse 14, he says, Do not worry about what to say ahead of time to defend yourself, for I will give you the mouth of a wisdom keeper, and no enemy will be able to answer you or prove you wrong. There's going to be some new ideas and some new words. Stop trying to bring up that old way. Don't even worry about what you're going to say. The Spirit will speak up. The Spirit will guide you and be with you and speak to you the new thing that's happening. We don't have to rely on old ways. We don't have to keep going back to old strategies. The Spirit will show us a new way. The second thing I think we have is the story of God. The story reaches back to Eve and to Sarah and through Miriam and Esther and to Ruth and Mary at the tomb and all the women who got Paul through. The story reaches through Rosa and Mammy and Samaria Rice. And this story says again and again, the end is not yet. What was, what used to have to be, does not always have to be. God is faithful. The story is in our own lives. It's in scripture. It's in the books and the stories and, the, and, the, and all the lives of the great crowd of witnesses. And it's in other people like us that can attest that despite the chaos, despite all the temples that are fallen, the end is not yet. And the third thing is us. We need each other. In verse 16, he says, you will be betrayed by your own family members and friends. They will even have some of you killed. They will all hate you because you are representing me and my teachings. And I don't think he's talking about people hating you simply because of your political views. He's talking about you being hated in the same way that he was. Because you brought the good news of a new paradigm. A new way that doesn't exploit or exclude, but is rooted in more and more justice that's ever forgiven and God's ever resurrecting love. Something that doesn't fit that us versus them narrative. And we're able to imagine a system in a new way that's more just. This is why Jesus was hated. And so in that, as we come together as a group of people who are imagining a new way and a new just way, we need each other. When all else fails, when our temples fall on the inside and the outside, we may only have each other. And God gave us us. There's God in the us in here. There's God in the, in the us in Sacramento. There's God in, the, in us in the street, in the corporate, in the political offices. That is the only God that will carry us through these moments. We all have temples falling in us and around us. And God in this, in this passage invites us to, to lose that attachment to the temple. But hold on to the spirit, hold on to the story, and recognize that as we go through it together, we need each other to get through. We can let go of our temples mournfully together and with, while barely holding on to what we think we might be grabbing to, we can trust God and know the end is not yet. Let me pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you for, for how you carry us. Thank you for how you take us to the next thing as, a, as, a, as an individual, as a people, as a, as a city, as a, as a country. We trust you as we watch things changing in us and all around us. We ask you speak to us and guide us into that next thing and carry us and help us to do it together because we may be all we have. It's in Jesus' name, amen.